Welcomed into this circle of women, of believers. I was delighted to receive the invitation. And uh, my husband and I always look forward to worshiping uh, with you all. I want to thank Reverend McClam for the invitation. The United Methodist Women. And Reverend Roper. She is surely a gifted leader of worship. I've always been blessed by her prayers. And... Um, as your sister in Christ, I have to do some shoe shopping together. <laughs> I just can't stand any longer. Her shoes are always better than mine. I'm going to share the wealth a little bit. This morning, I would like to bring you a word, if you will allow, from the Gospel of John, the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke. We're going to be in the 18th chapter. The 18th chapter and the 9th verse. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. The gross, not the net. But the tax collector standing far off would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and singing, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled. But all who humble themselves will be exalted. I pray to bring a message this morning on our theme, a calling for this time. A calling for this time. When I read this passage and I think about our dear Pharisee, I think about that popular phrase, too good to be true. It reminds me of uh, my parents who decided years and years ago, as you know I grew up in Greenville, to take on one of those weekends where they offer you the sales pitch if you'll stay in one of their condos. Have you ever been on one of those and you think to yourself, well, I'll take the free night, we'll suffer through the 90-minute presentation, and we'll have the rest of the weekend to ourselves. What's the harm, right? And so my parents decided to take advantage of this little sales offer to go up to a cabin in the mountains not too far away. And... And okay. not only did you get a free condo for the weekend, mm -hmm. you also got a free colored television. Right. Well, that just sealed the deal for my dad. So, <laughs> so they agreed to go up there for the weekend and listen to the sales pitch. And then at the end of their sales pitch, they said, now everyone gets their free TV. Just come by the front office before you leave. You have to check it out. Okay. So my dad drives around. The station wagon. <laughs> Can't wait to pull up to the office and pull out this big color TV and slide it into the truck. <laughs> he comes back out of the sales office and he's holding that TV in his hand. <laughs> it was one of those old transistor types with the long antennas. It was only about this big, like a foreign screen. <laughs> it was too good <laughs> to be true. <laughs> this morning. Well, often in our New Testament parables, we must say that, wow, those Pharisees, they get a bad rap, don't they? Amen, amen. When we think about someone being a Pharisee, it is far from a compliment. It's someone who is just too churched for their own good. They're too religious. They're too wrapped up in all things church. They're too wrapped up in the traditions of what we have always done. They know everything. They can't teach them anything about the Bible. They've been there, done that. They know how to run every ministry. They've done it or their sister or brother has done it. You, just, you can't teach them any new songs. They know everything and the way it should go and the key it should be in. You know, these are the Pharisees. They've been around the block. They set the 
rules and they are happy to tell you what the rules are and more than happy to enforce them. On the other hand, historically, however, we must give some credit to these Pharisees because the people of Israel found themselves under the oppression of Roman rule in the first century. The government of Rome ultimately destroyed their temple. Mm -hmm. And it was the Pharisees that really offered continuity for the Jewish religion. Mm -hmm. Their religion had always centered around the temple. Mm -hmm. But it was the laws and the practices mm -hmm. of the Pharisees that offered continuity in their religion. Mm -hmm. Because for centuries they had been asking the question, mm -hmm. How do we follow the commandments of God? Mm -hmm. How do we offer ourselves as sacrifices? Mm -hmm. How do we live in a way that is right with God? Mm -hmm. So when the temple was crumbled down to its very foundations, they were the ones that had been the pillars of the faith that gave them a way to continue to serve God <coughs> even though they didn't have a temple. So, so the Pharisees had their place. Mm -hmm. It's just sometimes some of them gave everyone else a bad rep, right? Amen. 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 Because they took their religion and their religious laws too far. Mm -hmm. Kind of like our own holy rolls. <laughs> they, they take the laws a little too far. Amen. 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 I encountered my first holy roller when I was in college. Mm -hmm. Now, when I went off to school, I had already received my college, so I had already planned to go to a Bible study and to go to church. Oh, yeah. even in college. But I wasn't a holy roller. I'm just saying I just planned to do this when I got to college. Amen. So I, I sang to the University Gospel Choir, and there were a few people in that choir who decided they were going to start a Bible study. And I thought, well, this is great. This is something that I did back home, and now I can have a place where I can continue to, you know, study the Bible. So I started going to this Bible study on Friday nights. And there was one particular student in there with whom I was very impressed. I mean, some people have a gift of memorizing scripture. I mean, they can just go on and on and on. They have not memorized the verse. They have memorized the chapter. We can be talking about anything. And they have a verse to go along with it. And then they can quote the chapter and the verse where they found it in the Bible. I mean, they have it together. And, and, and this particular student was one of those people. He just stood in awe of him. You know that he was someone who had really taken the time to memorize this thing, to put everything to heart. I was especially impressed with him because I actually had a class with him one time. I'll never forget. And the name of the class was Joanine literature. Mm -hmm. It was a religious class and it focused on all the books in the Bible that we attribute to John. Mm -hmm. The Gospel of John. Okay. First, second, and third of John. Mm -hmm. And the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. So the teacher was standing before us one day and, and giving some sort of lecture about the Joanine literature and was reading one of the scriptures in John and began to expound upon it and in conversation this particular student said uh, excuse me, I you're misquoting the scripture. And I looked at him, you know, thinking, even if she is misquoting, she's still a professor. She's the one that turned in your grade. Why are you even saying anything? It's just not her teach. And so she paused and she said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I have it right. And she kept lecturing. He raised his hand again and said, no, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't think you have that right. By this time, everyone in the class is like, whoa. And I'm thinking, well, he said he was good. We'll see how good he is. Because you know she promptly went over to the Bible, brought it back to the lectern, opened it up, and realized she was wrong. This man knew his scripture. She was misquoting the Bible. And yet he had gotten so good. <coughs> that one day he announced to us 
that he no longer had to go to church. Because he had learned everything that he needed to know. And I thought to myself, man, how many verses do you have to memorize before God, God's self, excuses you from church? I mean, that must be a lot. I began to learn that no matter how good we are, man, that was too good to be true. When God places a calling on our lives, we may think we're good, but we're never good enough. Because as soon as we think we have this thing nailed down, God I, I get that student and I, and I get the Pharisee because in our own isolated world, you know this church world that we live in, we think that after we join a couple of committees, and after we participate in a couple of ministries, I mean we go to church every Sunday, sometimes twice, we're there for the Wednesday service and Bible study, I mean we participate in the community events, you begin to think, well, and sometimes we look out on some of our newer members and we say, well, I'm doing a little more than them. I must be doing pretty good. Or maybe sometimes you look at our younger people and we say, I know I give more than them. I, I must be doing pretty good. And if we look at the people that we work with or in our neighborhoods or the ones that might be hanging around outside while we're inside the church, we say, I know I'm doing better than them. And maybe we watch a little TV and we watch Nene Lynx and Kim Kardashian and we say, I know I'm doing better than them ladies. And after a while, we begin to be very confident in where we are. We begin to be comfortable, even complacent. But complacency is the enemy. When God calls us, it is rare. It could happen. Yes. I don't know. It could happen. But it is rare that God will call you and say, but don't change a thing. You don't need to learn anything else. You don't have to change your schedule. You don't have to change your friends. You don't have to change anything about the worship order. You don't have to change any of the ministries. You don't have to change anyone from one position to another. You don't have to change how much you're giving. You don't have to change how much you're serving. But I am going to work this miracle through you. I'm telling you, be careful when God calls you. Because that rarely happens. I'm so glad we have the tax collector here this morning who serves to remind the Pharisee that your works are good but they do not save you. Now talk about a bad reputation. The tax collector is worse than the Pharisee. I mean, the tax collector is that jerk mm -hmm. in your neighborhood mm -hmm. that swindles you out of money year after year right after year. Right the tax collector, the insulting part was that the Roman government would use people of that Jewish community mm -hmm. to be the tax collector. Mm -hmm. This wasn't someone from another city who came through your town once a year telling you how much you owe the Roman mm -hmm. government. This was someone from your own neighborhood knocking on your door telling you how much the Roman government wanted from you this year. Mm -hmm. And do you know how he was paid? Mm -hmm. He got paid as much as he wanted. All right, now. He just added it to your tax right, yeah. and took it off the top. Right. And if you wanted to complain about it, 
Well, good luck. Mm -hmm. Because the Roman government expected him to exploit you to get his check because they weren't going to pay him anything. Mm -hmm. They were expected to get their money from whatever they could skim off of you. You can imagine he wasn't that popular. <laughs> so when people would have heard this story, they would have thought to themselves, oh, the tax collector, that jerk, he's the one who was right. But the one thing that the tax collector does is he recognizes that it can't be anything that I'm doing that pleases God. Okay, okay. It won't be anything that I'm about that's going to save me. This is about God doing something for me. And so he repents. Humility and confession are such an important part of our walk with God. The tax collector acknowledges that I am a sinner. I have fallen short of all that is holy. And I need you, God, to forgive me and to put me back in right relationship with you. That's what it means to be righteous. It doesn't mean that we do all the right things. That does not make us righteous. What makes us righteous is that God forgives us through Jesus Christ and puts us back into the right relationship with the divine. That's what makes us right. Although I have to admit, I feel like the parable ends too soon. You know, I mean, I hear this gut-wrenching prayer from the tax collector where he's just burying his soul and talking about how sorry he is and acknowledging God. And I just want to know what happens next. Don't you? I mean, it's kind of like when you watch these um, award shows, like the Academy Awards, the Oscars, and you see people who have been living hellacious lies the entire year. Mm -hmm. Their business is all over Twitter and Facebook and the tabloids. Mm -hmm. And then they stand on that podium when they receive the award and what do they do? I just want to give honor to God. <laughs> <laughs> collector's confession. Mm -hmm. Because the word says that uh, it is simply by his repentance uh, that he is made right with God. Yeah. Not what he did afterwards. Mm -hmm. But by his sincere repentance and forgiveness he is put in right relationship with God before he goes and does anything. Well, right now. Amen. Amen. But when people say I'm sorry mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you don't see anything afterwards. I mean, I'm just saying you have to wonder what really happened in the first place. And this is why. Once we sincerely repent, I mean, turn away from sin. Ask for forgiveness. Yes. Invite Jesus into our lives. Right. Recognize that Jesus is the only right. one who can forgive us and oh, save us. Right. There's something else that happens in that moment. You okay. realize this. All right. The Holy Spirit comes right. into our lives right. and begins a new work right. in us. Yes. The reign of sin is broken. And we are able to make different choices and live differently in our lives because of the power of the Holy Spirit. As John Wesley put it, we are always going on toward perfection. So there is a process there, and it, sometimes it doesn't happen overnight. Sometimes we make mistakes and we mess up and we are embarrassed and we wonder how we can end up back in this place. And the good news is we can seek forgiveness. And we can repent again. And the Holy Spirit will come into our lives again. And we can be placed back on the right track again. To pursue God again in right relationship. 
relationship. Right. Yes. Right. yes. Oh, but yes. something should happen after that prayer of repentance. Mm -hmm. See, when that Holy Spirit mm -hmm. is poured into your life mm -hmm. all over again. Yes. And so this morning, mm -hmm. as we think about the calling of our United Methodist women and our men, <laughs> we should hold our two models today in tension. Learning from the tax collector that we have to be honest with ourselves. Amen. Amen. All have fallen short. We need Jesus to cover our sins. Yes. To save us. Yes. To put us in right relationship with God. Yes. We can't do the church's mission without redemption and without the move of the Holy Spirit. Which means we also have to remember that it's not just about what God.